I really didn't have a lot of confidence in myself. I knew enough about the architectural profession to know that this is the tough part. <laughs> this is where you gotta build it. Well, now 50 plus years later, it is the greatest opportunity I've ever had. The story really begins in 1818 with the founding of Illinois in a small town in southwest Illinois called Kaskaskia. And that was our first capital city for two years. After that, they moved our capital city to Vandalia, which is essentially in the middle of the bottom third of the state of Illinois. Illinois was founded primarily through our river network, and so it makes sense. But as the state began to grow and that population shifted northward, there was already discussion in the 1820s of you know, access to government and how important that is and maybe a new capital city would be needed. And while they hoped to wait at least 20 years in Vandalia before they would move it again, by 1837, they had decided to relocate the capital city to Springfield. And on July 4th of 1837, Ground was broken and the cornerstone was laid, marking the initial building blocks of what we now call the Old State Capitol. The building has lived many lives. We know that the first session to be hosted in the large room on the second floor was Lincoln's last legislative session in the winter of 1840. After serving as a state house, from essentially 1840 until 1876. It then became used as the county building, and then even the county government ran out of space in the 1890s. So they actually raised the building to add a third level from the underside. So then it existed as a three-story county building until 1966, when it was sold back to the state of Illinois so that it could consider building a shrine to Abraham Lincoln. In 1963, the future of the old capital was really in jeopardy. Uh, there was a lot of, of folks who thought maybe what we ought to do is tear this place down. However, fortunately, there are a few folks who knew of the history of this building, how important this, this building was. And when we look across our world, many, many countries have been impacted or torn apart by civil war over the years. What Abraham Lincoln did to bring this country back together after the Civil War is a significant accomplishment, and other countries hold that in very high esteem. Having this Lincoln heritage here is very, very important. And when they can come to town and see the old state capitol and know that's where Lincoln got his start, they look at this community as somewhere that respects that history and understands the significance of it. Not only was the building the political arena for Abraham Lincoln, but it is the place where our state made important steps historically that shaped the way we live today. This is where our leaders gathered in 1865 to bring about the end of slavery by being the first state to step forward 
and note that they would support the constitutional amendment to end slavery. Architecture serves to symbolize for us our values and, and our goals. And I think that's one of the most important things uh, about this building is that it represents a place where historically people came together. It really is a unifying piece of architecture, not only for the capital city, but for the state of Illinois and our country as a whole. It's one of those unique landmarks that people look to to make us stronger and to bring us together. The plan was to restore the building, but to restore the building and get it finished in 1968. And even more specific, a date, June the 16th, it was the date that Lincoln gave his house divided against itself speech in the House of Representatives across the hall here. So that was the plan. It was a great plan, but now it had to be implemented. <laughs> Three young architects were tapped to find a solution, a way to accurately recreate the building just as it had looked in 1858 when Lincoln was here delivering his House Divided speech. Those individuals were Don Ferry, Augie Wisnoski, and Wally Henderson in the firm of Ferry and Henderson. My name is Augie Wisnowski. I'm a Springfield native. Wally Henderson, he was also a Springfield native. Don Ferry was a Springfield native. So we were all Springfieldians in one little, uh, one little office. The conference table was a card table and it had three chairs. And over on the other, other wall was a desk, a wooden desk. And on that wooden desk was a yellow IBM Selectric electric typewriter. That was our equipment. And then we had a drafting room, which was basically a closet, and then we had a closet. So there really wasn't much more room. So obviously, anytime Wally and Don met with anybody from the state of Illinois, they joined the Sangamo Club and went over there. We couldn't let anybody know where we lived. <laughs> in, in 1962, I was 25. Now, Wally was seven years older than me, so he was 32. Don was 30. So we were basically kids. We all had the feeling that, yeah, we could do it, but there's going to be a lot of pressure to try to take this project away from us. What's interesting about preserving a building in the 1960s is that essentially the field of historic preservation didn't exist. There were really no books that these young architects could follow. No one had come before them to really find a way to address the sort of problems that they were putting their minds to. One of the things that made recreating the building very, very difficult was the fact that many pieces of the building had in fact been changed between 1876 and 1966. Doors moved, walls added. So a lot of the evidence that an architect or an engineer would utilize in order to solve this mystery about what the building looked like historically was gone. Wally knew some of the history of the building, the fact that it was raised in the air in uh, 1900 or thereabouts. Sam uh, Bullard and Murray Haynes' father were the architects who were responsible for raising the building. We asked uh, Murray if uh, we couldn't borrow some drawings, you know, so we could look at and see what the building might have looked like prior to 1900. Well, Murray said, I'm sorry, but there are no drawings. What drawings we had were destroyed in the fire in the armory, and so we were left with nothing except the outside shell of the building, which really left the, the only option, well, let's just take the building apart, stone by stone. We'll see if we can't put it back together again. <laughs> the idea of taking it apart delicately, piece by piece, and saving the stone was found to be the course because in doing so, 
They could also create several advantages or really add value to the downtown and to the state of Illinois. At first, you know, we had our doubts. You're, you're gonna take this thing down stone by stone, and then that stone, two years later, it's gonna to have to be put in exactly the same place that it was two years earlier. How are we gonna do that and guarantee that that's gonna happen? We developed a coding system for the stones. Uh, we identified the, the column, you know, between each stone, the row, and then uh, what, what course it was in. And that information was put on a little card, which went off to five different locations in case everybody's office burned down or something. To help us understand the scale of the undertaking, we have to remember that the project was responsible for safely removing more than 3,300 stones, then taken to the Illinois State Fairgrounds where they would be stored until it was time to bring them back into the exact location from which each of them were removed. Uh, the most important thing when, when we was the accuracy of, of doing a proper restoration. And, and we all felt that, that we had, we had to be sure that we were right. The, the, the building began construction in 1837. So we tried to get all the documentation that we could get about the building in 1837. We had a, a page of a diary he said, as he walked up the south portico and through the door, on his left was the auditor, for example, and then he described basically where the various rooms were, but not necessarily what their sizes were or any, anything else. One of the key pieces of evidence was the old Sinemal Journal. They, they went so far as to put the list of building materials in the paper. And uh, glad they did because that gave us some clues to uh, how many lineal feet of uh, Corinthian cornice. And from that information, we could, we could decipher what the size of the room would be. We didn't know how close we were until the building was not occupied and uh, demolition was about to begin. And what we did then was remove plaster from the walls to see if we could find out where a, an earlier wall might have junctured with, an, with these bearing walls. And that's when we found out and verified that we were right on top of it. February 1966. The demolition of the building was uh, the first Op operation. I'm in my office and all of a sudden this loud boom shook the whole building. I really thought somebody had bombed it because that's what it felt like and it sounded like. The first thing that contractor did, he was a Chicago contractor by the way, so he didn't get a damn box with it. They cut the flagpole off and the doggone thing landed in the yard here on the north side and splattered mud all over the place because it was a, it was a kind of a rainy day. If this is a symbol of how the rest of the project is gonna go, <laughs> I was a little concerned. Otto Kerner was the governor at that time, and he was very concerned about us because we were going to put the building on what's called the fast track. That meant that we were going to let bids on various pieces of the building and not the whole thing at one time. The problem with that is you don't know what the final cost is going to be until you get to that last contract. The principals of the firm asked me if I would take a look at the cost estimate for the project. And you can look around and see the type of detail with the plastering, the woodwork, and everything else that was required. It was almost uh, something that you'd think, there's no way can we actually estimate the cost. But when you put all the pieces together, then you can come up with some numbers. So when we finished, there was a significant shortfall in the budget. They had to go back to the legislature to even receive some more funds. There was a deadline for the project. That was June 16th, 1968. 
We didn't make it. It was going to be December of 1968. So tell me what you discovered regarding the dome in the Senate. Oh, yeah, yeah, the dome. It was uh, drawn as a flat ceiling. And we didn't think there was anything too special about it. But in reading the Sangamo Journal, one of the stoves, I guess, gave off a lot of smoke. And the smoke rose into the dome. And he said, uh oh, <laughs> we have a dome. So it has a dome. <laughs> Under the um, architrave, there's a recess, and then every once in a while, there's a circle. And that circle is very difficult to, to make perfectly with plaster. The general contractor at the time, the Evans Construction Company, and there were two Canes, Ed Kane and Ed Kane Jr. Ed Jr. came into my office. <clears throat> he said, Augie, these, these darns, they, they were plastering at the time. They're so hard to, to do. He says, can we use a cake pan? And I'm thinking, yeah, a cake pan. It's perfect. It's the it's, uh, same size. It's, nobody will ever know. So he went, uh, Osco's drugstore was open at that time. And he bought every cake pan they had. <laughs> and, and we've got cake pans now. We made one oversight when we were coating the stones. The flat stones in the, in the building were easy to coat, but we didn't give an, a code to the columns. We knew where the columns were, but we didn't put a north arrow on the stone to say, this is, this is where it goes. Mm. So in order to identify which way was north, we had to find south, where the moss was. So we were able to put the stone in its proper position by identifying where the moss was. <laughs> it's gotta, gotta improvise. <laughs> Competing interests came together for a real symphony of a project in regard to the old state capitol. There were people who wanted to tear it down and make room for more parking in the downtown area. There were people who wanted to mound up dirt around the side in order to avoid having to take down the building entirely and reconstruct it. By taking it apart carefully and preserving all the stone, they empowered the team to accurately recreate the building just as it had looked during Lincoln's time, but they also opened the doorway to then dig deeper. Dig deep into the ground to create a two-story underground parking garage that could hold 400 cars. By finding a solution, that met all the needs of the different voices, the architects truly did make this a symphony. The parking garage or the parking decks were added to the project after the uh, restoration documents were finished. So that was kind of an afterthought. The depth was limited by the where the shale layer was and uh, it was 25 feet below the ground, so that gave us two levels of parking. I, I think the creativity of the parking can be compliments to the engineering firm, Hanson Engineers, because the first thing would be, well, put in columns and slabs. And of course, then how do you plant grass on the tops of that slab? We had studied or got word that a tree would require about five feet of soil to grow. So our engineers, I have to give them full credit, Hanson engineers came up with the idea of building a hyperbolic paraboloid, which was a 30-foot uh, square with sloping sides supported by a single column. The site is 330 feet, so 11 of them figured nicely in there. We could get three cars between each column. And uh, we had uh, eventually a vase, if you will, for a tree. Another way of being creative about answering a problem. Here you have something very contemporary versus something very historic. 
in the same site. It was so progressive that the Department of uh, Agronomy at the University of Illinois said our trees were going to be yellow and they wouldn't grow. So, uh, no, that hadn't been done as far as I knew. But uh, just to make a long story short, it worked out. By the time the team galvanized around an idea to rebuild the historic state house where Abraham Lincoln worked, it created a lot of media interest that of course brought a tremendous amount of pressure upon the three young architects and also the state leaders who had promised a very high profile project. You know, we didn't ask for the press, uh, but we got it. it. It received the attention worldwide essentially architectural magazines that I would receive separately that would be featuring this. St. Louis Post-Dispatch was doing features. These are the physical evidence of where this had drawn the attention of people across the country. Well, I think people began to believe that this building was important. Otto Kerner, he said, this is the most important building on the planet, let alone the county or the city. So, you know, we all believe that. As it grew, as they began to see, then they began to believe. I think state leaders bought into the project because it gave them hope. And I think Illinois' leaders were looking for something big. They were looking for something new. And they were okay with a playbook that hadn't been entirely written yet. It was pretty extreme, of course, and had nothing like it before. And it shows the importance of how local individuals, the architectural firm in particular, could step up and perform in a way that you'd expect this to happen in a big city. This wasn't a, a Chicago, New York firm that was called in to take in this huge uh, project, but I think the fact of it being local, the heart of everyone involved was in it. When we think about the confidence that the young professionals had at the time in order to even suggest a, you know, a project like this, that's backed up by the fact that they knew that Springfield and Illinois maintained the talent base to get the job done. What this says about the, the folks here in Springfield is that the technical expertise that you need doesn't have to be secured somewhere else. You can do it right here. And the nature of the people that live and work here are used to just figuring things out and finding a way to get it done. And they don't generally give up until they do get it done. And that this project is an example of that. And that spirit is still alive and well in our community today. Why not in Springfield, Illinois? We're as good as any city to be able to do things of that nature. Following the reopening of the building in 1968, the building became an important museum in the cultural network of Illinois. This is where individuals have come for more than 50 years to immerse themselves in the historic rooms where Abraham Lincoln worked, to reconnect with the words that Frederick Douglass shared, to learn more about the work of women during the Civil War. This is the place when our state leaders needed a place to gather to work on our state's constitution, they chose to come here. And it's no wonder that a young political leader becoming the first black president of the United States, he chose to make that first step of his announcement right here. It was here in Springfield where I saw all that is America converge. It was here it was here where we learned to disagree without being disagreeable. That it's possible to compromise so long as you know those principles that can never be compromised. And that so long as we're willing to listen to each other, we can assume the best in people instead of the worst. It was here in Springfield where North, South, East, and West come together that I was reminded of the essential decency of the American people where I came to believe that through this decency, we can build a more hopeful America. And that is why, in the shadow of the old state capitol, 
where Lincoln once called on a house divided to stand together, where common hopes and common dreams still live, I stand before you today to announce my candidacy for President of the United States of America. Today, we're proud to be the stewards of not only the largest artifact, the building itself, but also more than 2,000 additional items. Everything from ink wells to beautiful works of art. Today, we also include in the visitor experience an education gallery and a video room. We have to recognize that everything old isn't irrelevant and everything new isn't perfect. And historic preservation doesn't have to be in the way of doing innovative things and, and doing economic development. They can be supportive of each other. And the old state capitol, of course, was that centerpiece. But when it was done, people could realize, okay, now we understand. You put some money and effort into something like this, and there's a return for generations to come. It's an international appeal beyond Springfield, beyond Illinois, beyond the U.S. that come through this building so there's many features that grow out of this building right in the heart of the city. The Old State Capitol was a catalyst for future preservation projects, including the Lincoln home, including Lincoln's law office. It became an awakening where Springfield business leaders and political leaders realized together that our future would be built on weaving history and commerce and economic development all together presenting a very unique picture from that point forward to the world about what we're about and about what this community wants to be in the future. a tremendous sense of pride right now. I, I think about it and I think about what an unbelievable opportunity I had to be part of this, you know. It's uh, it just, I was very, very fortunate. It's important for us to tell the story so none of us take for granted every day when we walk by this building that it's just here. Every single day I park my car underneath this old state capitol and walk out and every single day I see somebody taking a picture of that building. And every time I see that I think, okay, I, I don't want to take this for granted, this is a big deal. When we think about the story of the reconstruction of the old state capitol, it's really important that all of our audiences keep in mind that history is unfinished. We've continued to try to learn more about the people who worked here to try to figure out more about the past that has given us the amazing gifts that we have today in this democracy. For that reason, it's a touchstone that, unlike any other, means more to people who want to make an investment in the future that isn't superficial. The building really accomplished a great deal, far more than preservation, far more than economic development. It got to the heart of our democracy and this experiment that we're involved in as a people, there's nothing else that can fuel us more than our history. Oh, golly, what a, what a, uh, that's a question. What would it be like if this project never happened? I guess we'd never know, would we? <laughs>